Welcome to video 3 of 3 on diagnostic statistics. This video will go over likelihood ratio and post-test probability. It's heavily based on videos 1 and 2, so make sure you review them before this video. By the end of the video, you'll be able to describe and calculate positive and negative likelihood ratio. You'll be able to use likelihood ratios to determine post-test probability. And you'll be able to identify situations in which testing would change management. Well, remember, in video two, we learned about sensitivity, specificity, positive and negative predictive values. And in video one, we learned all about the prevalence of disease, testing thresholds, and treatment thresholds. But now we need to figure out how to combine them in the care of a patient. So let's start with a patient. Let's call him Bob. And Bob is a 63-year-old man who comes into the emergency room with chest pain that came on all of a sudden, and it hurts when he breathes. It's been constant for about five hours, hasn't gotten any better or any worse. When you look Bob over, his blood pressure is 130 over 80 and heart rate is almost 120. He's breathing 22 times a minute and his oxygen sat is 88% on 2 liters nasal cannula and he doesn't have any crackles, rails, or ronchi in his lungs. So we develop a differential diagnosis, what we think is going on with Bob. Could this be a pulmonary embolism, a blood clot that's gone to the lungs? Could it be a heart attack? Could it be an aortic dissection where the innermost layer of the aorta comes apart from the other layers? Or is he just having gas? Is he just having some stomach pain? As with any disorder, we can identify thresholds based on the probability of the patient having the disease that we would treat or test further. In this situation, let's talk specifically about pulmonary embolism. That's a very dangerous diagnosis, so we would have a very low threshold to go ahead and treat. On the other hand, likewise, because this is a serious diagnosis, our testing threshold would be relatively low. We wouldn't want to miss too many people without the disease. And just as before, we have a gray area between the testing and treatment threshold where we're not sure what we need to do. So we have to figure out what is our pretest probability for Bob? What is the chance that Bob has a pulmonary embolism? So with these online scores, we found that there is some confusion about what the pretest probability is, but we could use the data to say that he has a pretest probability of about 15 or 16 percent. We see that that pretest probability of 15 or 16 percent puts Bob in the gray area. We don't know if we should go ahead and treat him. And we don't know if we can send him home. So this is where we need to decide if we're going to order some more tests. But let's go back for a second. What if Bob told us that he had had leg swelling? and had had recent orthopedic surgery. Well, now Bob's pretest probability is 45 or 50 percent. And so Bob should go ahead and get treated. We don't need any more tests before treating him to decide if he has a DVT or a pulmonary embolism. Luckily for Bob, but unfortunately for us, we're still in the gray area. So we need to decide on a test. We can do a D-dimer, which is a breakdown product of fibrin or of blood clots, and it's increased in the blood during clot formation. Unfortunately, there are several different things that can increase the D-dimer levels in the blood. There's another test that's a CTPE protocol, a CAT scan of the chest with IV contrast, which can identify if there are clots in the pulmonary arteries. There are other tests we could also use, but we'll just limit it to these two for this discussion. Each of these tests, like any test, has a sensitivity and a specificity. We see the D-dimer is very, very sensitive, but not very specific. So it might be a good test to rule out a pulmonary embolism. The CTPE protocol, though, is much more specific than it is sensitive. So that might be a good test to rule in a pulmonary embolism. Just using this information, though, it's hard to tell if either of these tests is good enough, if we need to order both of them, or if we just need one of them. Another way to put that is we don't know if these tests will give us a high enough probability that we would go ahead and treat or a low enough probability that we'd go ahead and send him home. This introduces the concept of likelihood ratios. And a likelihood ratio, put the most simple way, is how many times more likely is it that a given test result will occur in patients with the disorder than without the disorder. 
The other way to put it is if a patient is sick, what are the chances they have a positive test? Divided by if a patient isn't sick, what are the chances they have a positive test? This can also work with negative tests. So if we look at our same old 4x4 four four table, if we have a sick patient, a patient that's positive for the disorder, what are the chances that patient has a positive test result? Well, that's true positives divided by true positives plus false negatives. The second part of the question is if we have a healthy patient, patient without the disorder, what are the chances they have a positive test result? Well, that's false positives divided by false positive plus true negative. If we look closely, though, true positives divided by true positives plus false negatives, we've seen that number before. That's the sensitivity. And the second number, that's kind of the opposite of specificity. That's 1 minus the specificity. One thing I'd like to point out is that both sensitivity and specificity depend only on the test and the disease severity. They don't depend on the prevalence of the disease in the population. And together, these calculate the positive likelihood ratio, which also does not depend on the prevalence of the disease in the population. Same way we did a positive likelihood ratio, we can do a negative likelihood ratio, and it would end up being 1 minus the sensitivity divided by the specificity. So now for each of these tests, we can calculate positive and ne negative likelihood ratios. For D-dimer, the positive likelihood ratio is the sensitivity, 0.99, divided by 1 minus the specificity, which is 0.41. The negative likelihood ratio would be 1 minus the sensitivity over the specificity, and the same for the CTPE protocol. If we calculate these numbers out, we get these likelihood ratios. But that still doesn't get us anywhere closer to figuring out whether or not we should go ahead and treat Bob. So let's get together the information we know. Bob has a 16% probability of having a PE at the moment. And a positive likelihood ratio is the odds of a positive test in a patient who has a PE divided by the odds of a positive test in a patient who doesn't have the PE. If Bob does have a positive test, then Bob's positive likelihood ratio also equals Bob's odds of having a PE divided by Bob's odds of not having a PE. If we look closely though, we're working with odds under likelihood ratio and probability with Bob. So we should convert from probability to odds. If Bob has a 16% probability of having a PE, that's 16 times out of 100, or odds of 16 to 84, which is 100 minus 16. If the test we're talking about here is the D-dimer, then the positive likelihood ratio is 1.7. So we multiply these to decide what Bob's post-test probability is of having a pulmonary embolism. 16 times 1.7 to 84, or 27 to 84, or a 24% post-test probability of having a pulmonary embolism. If we go back to Bob, we've moved from a 15% pre-test probability to a 24% post-test probability. And we still don't know if we should go ahead and treat Bob or send him home. Also, it was kind of a pain to go through all of these calculations. There's got to be an easier way. So if we get rid of all of the calculations, luckily, T.J. Fagan invented a device called a nomogram, which can help take us from pre-test to post-test probability. I know this is small and hard to see, but column one shows pre-test probability. In the middle, we have likelihood ratios, and on the right, we have post-test probability. Bob's pre-test probability is 0.16, somewhere between one and two. The positive likelihood ratio of a D-dimer is 1.7, somewhere between one and two. And so if we draw a straight line, we get to a post-test probability somewhere between 20 and 30 percent. So this nomogram got us to the same answer without having to do all of those calculations. Luckily, JAMA Evidence has computerized this nomogram. On this nomogram, we can use the same cutoffs, our testing and treatment thresholds, that we had before, and we still have that same gray area from before. So now let's see whether a positive or negative test would help us in this case. So first we'll put in Bob's pretest probability, 16%, and now we'll go through the different tests. Say we has a positive D-dimer, his post-test probability of PE would only be 24%, like we calculated before. 
Say he has a negative D-dimer with a negative likelihood ratio of 0 0.02. Now his post-test probability is almost 0%. So that would get him out of the gray area and we could send him home. What if we did a, a CT? The positive likelihood ratio of a CTP protocol is almost 21, which gives us an 80% post-test probability of a pulmonary embolism. So we should go ahead and treat Bob. If we have a negative CTP protocol, it's got a negative likelihood ratio of 0.17, which leaves Bob at still having a 3% chance of having a PE. It's under our 5% treatment threshold, but it does not make us as confident as a negative D-dimer. Now we can see how these likelihood ratios show us which tests will most help us decide where Bob should go. In this case, with all of the information we looked at before, the CTPE protocol will be the most definitive test. Let's go over our take-home points for likelihood ratio. The definition of likelihood ratio is the proportion of people with a disease and a given test result versus the proportion of people without the disease and the same test result. As we saw before, likelihood ratios are related to sensitivity and specificity and do not depend on the prevalence, but they do depend on disease severity and the specific test. A likelihood ratio of greater than 10 gives us good information and helps us rule in disease. And a likelihood ratio of less than 0.1 is a good test and helps us rule out disease. Likelihood ratios are also the best way to calculate between pretest probability and post-test probability, which can be done with a Fagan nomogram. And finally, the conclusion from all three of these talks should be First, assess the prevalence or probability of disease based on the information you already have. Only order more testing when it will change what you do and when you are in the gray area. You should decide what information you want out of your test, whether you want to rule in the disease or rule out a disease. And you should decide whether the test you are ordering matches that goal. Finally, don't order tests that cannot answer your clinical question. Don't order a D-dimer if you want to make sure somebody has a PE because it's not confirmatory. It's only useful to rule out. Now that you've seen these three videos, you have the tools needed to assess the diagnostic utility of tests and the appropriate time to use them. Good luck.